big win for the AFD, the far-right alternative for Germany party, came as no surprise for anyone. Post-Brexit, this shift to the right has been palpable in Europe. The politics of populist nationalism is often vilified in the media. On Gravitas tonight, we discuss how the phenomenon is unfolding the world over and why we need to shed prejudice and understand why more and more people are voting for the nationalists. And Palki Sharma Upadhyay, the headlines first. Hillary Clinton hits back, calls Jared Kushner's use of private emails the height of hypocrisy as a Congress committee writes to the White House to demand more information. Alternative for Germany co-leader Frog Petri quits the party in a shock announcement, says she will sit in the lower house but as an independent. In an attempt to break the Brexit deadlock, European Council President Donald Tusk meets the British Prime Minister. Theresa May says there's been no sufficient progress. Protests turn violent in Nairobi as police use tear gas and batons to disperse crowds. Opposition demands removal of election commission officials before the rerun of the presidential vote. Also on the show, a Pakistani spy exposes a link between the intelligence and terrorists moves court against the IB in that country. As the U.S. Defense Secretary firms up strategic ties with India, Delhi's biggest defense supply, Russia, conducts military drills with Pakistan. How the discovery of a Hindu mass grave in Myanmar throws up more questions on who's behind the bloodshed in Rakhine. The Kurdish referendum might get an overwhelming yes vote, but there are many who say no. Who are these people and what do they fear? Dubai tested a flying taxi today. From self-driving cars to the Hyperloop, what does the future of transportation look like? And China denies a visa to Man Kaur, a 101-year-old marathon runner from India. She says she's been robbed of a potential medal. All of those stories coming up ahead on the show. But first, to Europe, the entry of Germany's AFD. And given the country's dark past and the avowal of its people to never allow the rise of intolerance again. But just days after the election, the party is already in dis disarray with its chief resigning and taking others with her. But is the rise of the right wing really so unique and restricted to Europe alone? And does right of centre always mean racism and intolerance? Senior Foreign Editor Padma Rao takes a look. Germany's alternative of your Deutschland has made a sensational entry into German parliament by emerging the third largest party. To those with scant knowledge of Germany, their win was merely an I told you so moment. After all, this was the home of the murderous Nazis 70 years ago. What else could one expect? The truth lies elsewhere. The AFD may have fringe element supporters who sport mohawks and scream foreigners out. Its leaders may have celebrated their victory by declaring they would now get their country and their people back, presumably from the clutches of little green aliens. But whether the politically correct liberal left of the world like it or not, the so-called right wing has been steadily on the rise around the world. And never mind what the chattering classes say, right wing does not automatically translate as racist, xenophobic and intolerant. The far and hard right are undesirable elements of most right of center parties. Many parties ruthlessly use such loony fringes as launching pads merely to register an election victory. Here are some of the right-wing organizations around the world, ranging from rabidly right-wing to conservative. And unsurprisingly, many of those that target foreigners belong to former colonial powers that had colonized the very countries whose people they now shun. There's the National Front or the Front National in France, founded by people who had collaborated with the Nazis. Like many others, the Front National, under its leader Marine Le Pen, did try to soften its rhetoric before the last presidential election, which it lost. But there is no doubt that the Front National's brand of nationalism has come to stay. Then there's the United Kingdom Freedom Party, UKIP, which came out of nowhere and quickly became the third largest party in the United Kingdom. Britain colonized and plundered practically half the world and yet the UKIP wants to kick foreigners out. Their fringe elements may be rabble-rousing violent thugs, 
Some may even be led by a Twitter-crazy, unpredictable president. But many conservative parties, like the Republicans in the United States, Thank are just that, centered and averse to the kind of la-la land liberalism that has inflicted all those who call themselves democratic leftists, but in reality display frequent signs of extreme right-wing tolerance when it comes to allowing conservatives to share in the very democratic principle of free speech. The situation in India is very different from that in the United States. Prime Minister Narendra Modi continues to be everybody's favorite whipping boy. From a sudden shower to an aircraft delay, from heavy rainfall to an aircraft delay, from a bad restaurant meal to a haircut gone wrong, Indian liberal elitists never lose an opportunity to indulge in some good old Modi bashing. His Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP, does indeed have its share of intolerant and incontinent supporters, but its policies are firmly and definitely centrist. But for a party with rabid elements to register a win in Germany, the model of political correctness due to its dark and murderous past is one matter. To face the barrage of hatred and abuse being heaped upon it now by, yes, liberals is quite another. The AFD is fragmenting already. Just two days after the election, its party chief, her husband and at least two other leaders quit. Will the world now see the emergence of a moderate AFD? Quite conceivable. After all, this is Germany, and the pressure to shun extremism since the murderous Nazi era runs much, much deeper in German veins than is commonly known. Padma Rao, Vion. Joining us this evening on Gravitas, Daniel uh, Dylan Bioma, editor at the Foreign Desk of Die Welt, with us from Berlin, and Mandy Clark, uh, Vion's London bureau chief, uh, also joining us. Good evening to both of you, Daniel. What explains the rise of the right? Are the liberals, uh, including many sections of the media, living in an echo chamber? Do they fail to sense the pulse of the people? Well, I would say there are competing echo chambers here. There's definitely an echo chamber among, uh, around the liberals and around their parties. There definitely is also an echo chamber on the populist right, uh, which has created for uh, the adherents of the AFD a picture of their own country being in danger by uh, droves of millions and millions of Muslims overrunning the country, um, multiple rape crimes all over, and simply a breakdown of the uh, social order. Some people uh, who vote for the AFD really believe that this is imminent, while Germany is actually economically and security-wise doing better than all the rest of Europe. But there is obviously um, a party state and a party system here that has held power for decades and has um, shared power between two big parties um, who were very influential all over society and um, did the deals in Europe, some of which uh, people um, on the ground here in Germany didn't like. And I think what we are seeing in Germany, uh, same as uh, in other countries in Europe, is a um, sentiment against the establishment that some people feel is selling out the identity and the social structure of the countries in question. Mandy, Brexit was a shock, but I'm assuming more for the media than the people of Britain now that we have the wisdom of hindsight and the trends elsewhere. Has the centre and the left been able to come to terms with what has happened and been able to figure out why this is happening? Uh, certainly, Brexit was a shock, definitely for the media, but uh, it's important to remember it was a pretty close ballot. So, um, but it, the assumption was that the the right didn't have as much uh, influence and power over the rest of the country, and the, uh, there was a, definitely what what's called in the UK anyway a London bubble. This London elite that had no real concept of the sentiment and feel, feelings in the in the rest of the country that that aren't the the economic powerhouse that London really is. So there has been a shifting in British policies uh, we've seen that to appeal to that the, those uh, right wing voters who uh, certainly felt strongly about Brexit and strongly the key issue about Brexit was really immigration. And so we're seeing it reflect, even though they might not have a, a seat at the table in Parliament, it's changing the way the Parliament works because the politicians are trying to appeal to that right-wing sentiment, and we're seeing a lot more policies shift more hardline, more to the right. And this is happening all over Europe, uh, to to in, in in various in varying degrees. Daniel, what does this gradual shift mean for Europe and for the for the values it stands for? Well. 
I think it might mean, um, f first and foremost, that Europe is in danger of losing its edge in both economic modernization and in social modernization, because what is the bottom line of all these parties is that um, the trend towards globalization, opening up economies, uh, making economies more flexible and also making societies more, um, more uh, uh, varied and more open uh, should be reversed. And I think that could um, actually set Europe back in the global competition. And it also means that the European Union as a multilateral organism could be um, hampered um, from continuing to integrate. It will be harder to make deals among European nations, among EU nations, if the governments in their countries, in their individual countries, are under pressure from populist parties who um, actually demand less European integration, less deals being made on the EU level. And if we're looking for the remedies um, that uh, are found in individual countries for stopping those populists, it usually is taking up their demands. So politics in Europe on the whole um, is in danger of moving to the right. Well, Mandy, is it a foregone conclusion, uh, taking forward from the point that Padma made, that uh, the right wing is necessarily intolerant and racist, or are these stereotypes that we need to, uh, to, to reconsider, to rethink? Well, I, th I, think, um, I think nobody fits a stereotype. So there are certainly left right wing policies, um, but not everyone are, are these, these hardcore right wingers who uh, there are definitely elements of racism and, um, and extremism in those hardcore right wings. But there's many, a lot of uh, people who follow right wing policies that just uh, feel outside of the economic, oh, after the economic um, recession happened, there was economic recovery and they were just outside of that. So th there are communities that feel outside of it but who aren't necessarily racist. I think when it comes to right wing, there is it's a broad brushstroke that includes lots of people. Um, but what is important is that certainly the UK politicians just seem to leave a lot of those people who felt left behind, they weren't listening to them, and it was these right-wing groups like UKIP that had their ear and said, we are listening to you, and that's where that momentum really came from, at least in the UK. Daniel, uh, speaking of Germany in particular, the AFD is already splitting. Uh, do, you, do you foresee a situation where they may have to dilute their agenda? Well, that's the question, if they are going to dilute it or if, in fact, they will radicalize in Parliament. Um, I can just take up the cue from Mandy, who just um, talked about the various shades of uh, right-wing populism here. What's um, this, this rise of right-wing populism in Europe actually shows as a combination of two elements, some rabid uh, racists, and um, in Germany you would call them neo-Nazis who have always been there, and those who are simply disappointed with the way that European integration and globalization has gone and the, with the path of the elites here. And um, these factions are just sort of splitting up in the AFD in Germany now, and the chairwoman of the AFD who has declared um, that she will leave the party today. She is actually the most um, popular um, figurehead that the AFD had, so it is a loss for the party. But she had um, been not in line anymore with the party mainstream for um, for the months um, uh, of the campaign. Actually, her party was far more right wing, far more racist, far more anti Islam than um, Frau Kapitli herself had been, and so. That split that we're seeing now is actually showing the uh, inner contradictions of this movement. Right. I'm going to leave it at that. Daniel, Mandy, thanks very much for weighing in on this. Uh, and this is not just restricted to Europe. This is a, a worldwide phenomenon from Shinzo Abe in Japan to Donald Trump in the U.S. and everything in between. The rise of the right is, it seems, here to stay in the near future.